So after um, talking about distemper, um, it's really exciting to talk about parvo because we love parvo. <laughs> um, um, parvo is really great as a, as a disease because it's easy to catch suspicious cases. Um, we've got a quick, reliable test. Um, we have reliable outcomes, and we know what that's going to be in a, in a fairly... Um, predictable amount of time, and we know there's a set timetable for the disease. So for prevention, everyone in the shelter is responsible. Um, Vaccination upon intake, thank goodness we now do that, and everybody is so on board with it. They know how important it is. Um, Staff and volunteers identifying um, cases. When we get a transfer of puppies that come in, um, I have one, one of the technicians, I think she's as good as an ELISA test for Parvo. Um, there will be a litter of puppies, and she sees one that just looks a little bit dopey. She, she grabs, she always has a handful of tests when those transfers come in, um, and she's really good at catching the positive cases. Um, the shelter techs will run the confirmatory tests if we have a, a volunteer or a staff who's concerned. Um, people are always monitoring for diarrhea and, and lethargy. Uh, the veterinarians oversee the, the case management, and the technicians do the, do, the, do the patient care. So we have our really mind-blowing SOP for Parvo that was developed over the course. It looks like the last time it was re- revised was in 2008, um, but it was, you know, the, the first draft was probably done in, in um, 2000, 2002, um, so it's a three-page document that really it's Parvo SOP for dummies. Every single step is really addressed in this SOP. Um, so, you know, describing clearly what the, um, what the symptoms are, um, how we're going to test the, the dogs, um, who's, what defines direct contact, and um, which animals are going to be quarantined. So the second page, you know, where are these animals going to be? How are we going to house it? So with our, within our shelter, you know, we've designated five different rooms that we could potentially put Parvo in. Um, and it depends on how big the quarantine could potentially be. Um, we have not implemented titers yet. And I think that part of that is because of maternal antibody interference. Um, really, the only puppies, the ones that we're worried about are the ones that are... Um, four months and younger, and those are the ones that it's not reliable for the titer testing, um, m- might play with it a little bit and see what happens. We did have um, one, our, we used our last wells of a titer check, Vaxacheck titer kit on our last Parvo outbreak, and we had a litter, we had a, a group of puppies, gosh, I'm trying to remember if they came from New Mexico or Oklahoma or Kansas, and um, there was a litter, there was a group of four puppies, I don't think they were all related. I think it was three different litters. Two looked alike, and the other two didn't really look very much alike. And one of them broke with with Parvo. We tested the other three with the titer check, and two of them had no titer at all, the two that looked alike that were likely um, litter mates. The other one had had a titer. We went ahead and quarantined all four, or all the three remaining. We treated the positive. We quarantined um, the other three, and they just finished their quarantine last week, and none of them had even a hint of lethargy or diarrhea during the two-week quarantine. So that was really, you know, I, it's, it's, it's a struggle to know what the right answer is. Um, but I think the more we play with titers and the more information um, we can share with each other, um, the more we'll understand how to best, how to best utilize it. Um, and then, of course, as any, you know, the most important thing for, for the SOP is um, how we're going to clean and disinfect the rooms, what the staff is supposed to wear. So it really outlines um, everything for the, for the shelter staff on um, how, to, how to deal with the quarantine area because the active cases of Parvo are in the clinic. So the shelter staff, their, their responsibility is to, you know, identify any any suspicious cases, they can, um, they can pull a test. If it's, you know, late in the evening and somebody sees um, a case they're suspicious of and the um, vet clinic staff is gone, they know where the Parvo tests are. 
they can run the tests on Sundays if the, vet, if the veterinarian's not here, um, not there, they can, they can run the tests. Any positive animals are moved to the, the clinics, and then we begin um, quarantine of the puppies in direct contact. And the direct contact perimeters were really a challenge for us to come up with because, you know, we have a truckload of puppies. They were all handled in the morning at the transferring shelter um, by a group of staff who loaded them into the truck. Um, They're supposed to be free of any signs of disease at the time of the transfer pickup, which often is at like 3 to 5 in the morning. Um, So do we quarantine the entire transfer? And that was a big question. So we don't quarantine the entire transfer. We do quarantine puppies from the same litter. Um, Puppies are dogs from the same kennel. Even if we have guillotine dividers, so if they were um, together, um, we're we're worried enough that we're going to quarantine both sides of that. And then puppies or dogs that were in recent play groups with the the positive dog or puppy. And then adult dogs. An adult we consider six months and older. Um, that have two, two vaccinations, those aren't, those aren't quarantined. So exposed animals are kept um, in separate rooms from active parvo animals, and we know that some, you know, sometimes a puppy will test positive for parvo, but it never lost its appetite, and it's still very, very active. Um, we're not going to keep that puppy in the same ward with those puppies that are in quarantine. That puppy still has to be in the clinic for, for treatment. So the 14-day the quarantine starts from the original day when symptoms, um, or where symptoms were noted or date of exposure. Puppies are, we continue vaccinating them if they're due for um, distemper as appropriate. And then the veterinary technician, as she does her rounds, is monitoring that, um, that ward closely, those groups of puppies, for any lethargy or diarrhea. And oftentimes, you know, the diarrhea, you know, will run a fecal and um, in a quarantine group of puppies, and they'll have coccidia or something. <clears throat> so during the quarantine period, if after about seven days they, they're still not exhibiting any signs of disease, um, we'll go ahead and spay and neuter them, and then return them to the quarantine ward when the surgery is done, and then at day 14, um, vaccinate them. If they, if, or, you know, we'll keep, go ahead and keep them up to date on their vaccines, and then move them to the adoption center on day 14. So puppies that test positive, and um, that's all in the um, Shelter Medicine Journal, it, it really is, is just a guideline for the veterinarians that we're all doing the same thing. We have a positive a parvo-positive exam and treatment plan template that's in PetPoint. We also created one um, in Avamark, which is our clinic software, so that because we often treat um, puppies post-adoption, um, and they, they would be entered into our system through um, a different software program. So we've created um, templates that outline the exam and the treatment. Also in our quarantine area, we laminated a sheet that has all the drugs and dosages, and that's kept in the isolation ward. And that way we can, you know, the technicians, if there's a positive parvo puppy, that puppy will be started on medications and, and treatment before a veterinarian even um, lays hands on it because oftentimes a veterinarian is, is in surgery or seeing uh, um, vet appointments. So we can start the parvo treatment before a veterinarian even touches, um, an ant, touches the dog. And then... Um, the, uh, you know, a more detailed outline of Parvo is in the Shelter Medicine Journal. But this ensures that everybody is on the same page in the shelter and in the clinic. Um, because the shelter staff, they would wonder, well, that puppy's been, you've been treating that puppy for five days. When is, what's going to happen? What are you doing now? And they really, they were demanding um, steps along the way of when we were going to make a euthanasia decision um, or not. And um, sometimes you don't know. Sometimes those puppies will turn around just when you think they're going to die <laughs> or um, you think this is a horrible case and you walk in the next morning and that puppy is ready to eat. So it was really a good way to, exp- um, to educate them that um, we're not going to know right away, but it's really not a long period of time before we'll have an answer. 
So it's really Parvo on autopilot. Um, so the vet will do an initial exam, but that puppy might already have an IV catheter in place. Um, but the, the veterinary technicians can go ahead and initiate um, the treatment without a veterinarian having seen the puppy yet. Um, and then, like I said, the, the sheet, it's laminated. We have a couple, I think we have two copies of it, but one lives in the, um, in the isolation ward. So there's a little puppy. Um, we, do, we do treat them with IV fluids, and we have IV fluid pumps. Um, we get a lot of donate, donated um, puppy pads. People, it, they just show up randomly. We, don't, we rarely buy them, um, but they, they really come through the, through the door, and we, um, um, we covet them in the clinic. So they get an, you know, an e-collar. He's all set up to, to go, puppy on auto, on Parvo puppy on autopilot. So the technicians place an IV catheter. In the, in the Shelter Medicine Journal, it does say obtain a blood sample. And there were some criticalists in the, um, in the Denver metro area. Uh, they'd given some, some um, CE about Parvo. And if you track, if you serially track the white blood cells on a blood smear, um, they felt they could deter, pre, it was a prediction of, of outcome. So, you know, we were doing some blood work initially, maybe an initial PCV total protein. But after, you know, several dozen cases, we realized that it didn't really change the outcome and it really didn't change the initial treatment plan at all. So I think it's very rare that, uh, that we'll draw blood and do any initial blood work. Um, the, our shelter medicine interns, I think they're more likely to do it because I think it's important for them to follow the cases through. So we'll start fluids. Um, we have LRS with 5% dextrose. We give them an initial bolus of 10 mils per pound, and then we'll give them um, an IV ampicillin at 10, mil, 10 mg per pound, and then we'll add the remaining gram or whatever remains of that ampicillin into the um, bag of fluids and add 20 mil equivalents of KCL and then run the fluids at two to three times maintenance. Um, and then we define maintenance at 30 mils per pound per day. And then once the dog is hydrated, we start um, genomycin. So if we start fluids in the morning, it'll get its first um, IV dose of genison. In the evening, if we start fluids in the evening, it'll get IV genison um, the following morning. And then we automatically start um, famotidine. We give that IV once a day. And the handy calculator is that it's the same dose as serenia, um, the same volume as serenia, and that's also part of the treatment plan. So you can um, just do the, the volume based on weight on the serenia bottle, and that's the same dose as the famotidine. You just have to make sure you label the the syringes because the famotidine goes IV and the syringe goes sub-Q. Um, and then most of the puppies are also treated for pain. Um, and we just, you know, just for easy reference, we have the dosages listed on the, on the laminated sheet. And most of them do, most of them are vomiting, so we'll go ahead and start antiemetics. Um, we've been using syringe um, because it was working so well. Is it now that Ondansetron is cheaper. We, we might be using that a little bit more. But at least we have all of these options listed on the laminated sheet. And with all of the drug recalls, it's really nice to, to know that those are there and we've hopefully covered, covered our bases. And then we'll treat them um, until, the, until it's been 24 hours that they haven't been vomiting. If they've been on Serenia, then we'll switch them to something else because they can only be on the Serenia for, um, for five days. And then how do we know when to stop? The, you know, this is a picture of a puppy who is really, um, you know, we feel that we're not helping that puppy by continuing to treat. So if, the, um, if there's pain or vomiting, everything is really uncontrolled by medication, um, it doesn't seem to be responsive to treatment, we'll do a euthanasia. And then we also, you know, if, if they're not responding to treatment, um, we're, we're um, considering distemper as, as a complicating factor as well. We used to never really consider distemper, um, but now, you know, any puppy that has parvo, 
Um, if it starts to have a snotty nose, we're automatically considering distemper. So distemper is, is high, on the, high on the differential list for every puppy that comes in um, for parvo. And then if a puppy is, seems to be, pr- you know, progressing, stop vomiting, or at any time, um, you know, we can start head of starch. And that's listed on the, on the sheet so that we don't forget that that's, that's an option. Um, sometimes when things are on autopilot, you forget to add things in. Um, and then if we do diagnose an intussusception, um, we're going to euthanize that puppy. So, so once the puppy, puppy stops vomiting, vomiting um, we'll, we'll switch it to oral medication, medication, and we just automatically choose um, amoxicillin and metronidazole, and we RX a seven-day um, script. And then when the animal, when the puppy does have um, normal stools and, and is eating well, and it was probably eating well when we started on its, on its oral meds, um, we, we give it a bath, bath and we spay-neuter spay it, if it hasn't already been spayed or neutered, and then we move it right into the adoption center with a medical disclosure that says this puppy has um, been treated and recovered from parvo. So that's the, that's the medical disclosure, and it includes the webs, um, the resource of veterinarypartner.com, which gives the, uh, the adopter a lot of information um, if they have more questions about, um, about Parvo. Um, we, for, for a while, I did run a Parvo test on the puppies that recovered, and I never had one positive, so I just decided, why, you know, why are we wasting our time and resources um, running a Parvo test on a puppy that has um, normal stool? There, there still is a concern that that puppy could be um, shedding the virus, so that's communicated to the, to the adopter that that puppy needs to stay away from unvaccinated puppies. So one of the um, um, questions that, that I'm sure that you might have is, how can you treat parvo with IVs and IV fluid pumps? Um, we don't have the resources to do it. And we're a really busy clinic, and I think that the fluid pumps are great. I think if you don't have fluid pumps, it's it's hard to treat um, with IV. Fluid pumps are really, really expensive. They come with, you know, they have the specific IV line that matches them, so that's expensive. Um, overall time and care for Parvo is really expensive. Um, so how can how can you afford treating treating Parvo? And of of course, I think we treat Parvo a lot cheaper than any of the clinics in in the area. And we have a lot of clinics that actually refer their clients to us for parvo treatment. So I think we, we have a, we probably treat more parvo than any, any clinics. There are some veterinarians that don't even have parvo tests because in their demographic area, um, they're so well isolated that they don't see dogs that have parvo. So some of the things you can do are targeted fundraising, um, campaigns for special cases, and media coverage during outbreaks. Yeah, that's that's the the end of my parvo talk. <laughs> <laughs>